um, get that out of the way before we get started. Um, we're in Galatians chapter 4 today as we're resuming our uh, study through Galatians. Um, Jeff Foxworthy has a, uh, you know, all of his redneck jokes, which some of them I, I really do appreciate. Um, you know, he makes a statement, said, if, if your family tree is a single line, you might be a redneck. Or today we're going to be taking a look at, at a family tree and putting some things together, maybe in a way that we've never really seen. Um, because this is, this last part of Galatians chapter 4, uh, it, when you go through and read it, it's like, yeah, so why do we need to know this? Um, it is so difficult in my observation, and this is probably one of the passages of Scripture through Galatians that I've had the hardest time um, Reconciling, I guess, or getting it to fit in. Because here's what's going on. Paul's making several arguments about law and grace, and he comes to this last one. And in every single, like every major study that I've seen, um, here's what Paul does. Is he takes a passage of scripture and he he changes from just here's history, he applies or uses um, the analogy, if you would, uh, and make some doctrine out of it. What I've seen in, in, in Bible study and in ministry, and, and these things will happen from time to time, when Scripture uses what's called an analogy, or takes a story out of the Old Testament and, and applies a different kind of truth to it, Scripture has the authority to do that. What becomes dangerous is you and I in our Bible study, when we will take a passage and we will apply something to it that it doesn't mean. Um, like here's a case in instance. I read a sermon a number of years ago that kind of proves this point. Um, remember when Abraham cut a covenant and you know he's waiting on God and he's chasing the birds away? Well, the sermon that I heard said you know he chased away the birds of, of anxiety. And he changed away the birds of depression. And he changed away the birds of whatever. And it's like, now, now wait a second. I'm not just saying it's not a a good sermon, not a needed sermon, but that's misapplication of Scripture, trying to take a story like that and apply different things to it. What Paul does here, with the authority of Scripture, is he gives us a deeper insight into what God was doing in Abraham's life. So we're going to pick up here in Galatians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick up about the story about Hagar and Sarah and about their children and verse 21. It says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. I'm going to pause here for real quickly. Um, Abraham had two sons. Um, we have Ishmael and Isaac. Um, I guess for points of illustration, we're going to stick Ishmael over here. Uh, you know, God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, you know, you're going to have children, you're going to be blessed, you're going to have a great nation. And God uh, gave that promise to Abraham. And sometimes when God gives us promises, we do the same thing that Abraham does, and we want to go ahead and help God out. <laughs> well, as Abraham's getting older, he's thinking about all this. He's like, well, you know, God, we're still, you know, Sarah and I still aren't having children. We're into our 90s and older. It looks like we're not going to be having them anytime soon. So... Sarah and Abraham got together and had this idea, well, we'll help God out. Sarah gives Abraham Hagar a, a, a maid servant, and they have a child, Ishmael. Now, a number of weeks ago, when we briefly talked about this, this is, for lack of a better term, us trying to bring the promises of God out in our own way. We're going to make the promises of God happen that's what Abraham was trying to do. What happens is that here is the case that Paul makes. He's the child of the slave woman. In other words, whenever we try to do life in our own work, in our own strength, it will end up looking like this. We have, on the other hand, Sarah who gives birth to Isaac. A seemingly impossible thing when you go through and read the story. You know, here, here's 
Uh, Sarah, she overhears, oh right, I'm going to have a child that she laughs. God, in this sense of humor, has named the, hang on, hey, named the, the, the child Isaac to remind you every time that you call his name that <laughs> you laugh at God's disbelief or, or you laugh at God's impossibility of doing this thing. And so we have a child of work, we have a child of the promise, we have Isaac. It's interesting to me that not only when you figure in what Isaac's name means, that there is something about laughter, there is something about joy when we trust God to do his thing in his time. We have a child of work, of law. We have a child of grace, a child of the promise. Um, we have a slave. We have a free child. Two different sons, two different promises, and an understanding that they are different as Paul brings the story into Galatians and takes a look at it. Now here's where he starts taking the story uh, from the Old Testament and, and applying something things differently. He says, these things may be taken figuratively. For the women, for the, for the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. Get this, this is strange. And corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. So we have Hagar, the slave. We also have a, I'm going to call it Jerusalem below. Okay? Here's the physical Jerusalem. It's a, it's a, it's a city of slavery, a child of slavery. And there's something about this that Paul starts weaving in to understand, here's how things work. It all has to do with slavery over here. When you're living life according to, to legalism, you'll find yourself in that idea and in that tendency of being slave. We've seen that throughout the book of Galatians thus far. We have two covenants. He said these are covenants. So we have one with the Jerusalem below, and we have another one here of the Jerusalem above. Continue on with me in the next verse, if you would. Uh, but the Jerusalem that is above, verse 26, is free, and she is our mother. When you get to this next verse, verse 27, this is a quote out of Isaiah 54. Now, it's probably no surprise to you that Isaiah 54 follows right after Isaiah 53. <laughs> if you're familiar with Isaiah 53, it's a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the next verse, after we see Jesus Christ on the cross, as in our numbering system in English, we have Isaiah 54, verse 1, it's quoted right here. And, here, and if you're just reading this, it's like, I don't really get this, so I just skip it. Go on. So here it is. Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, if you just read this, and in the context, it's like, Paul, why are you throwing this one verse out, and what does it mean? Here's what it's saying. There's a children, the children of the desolate woman are greater than those of the woman who has a husband. When you understand the pictures that are going on throughout the Old Testament, it's amazing to me how God, as he approaches Israel, it's almost as if there's a picture of her being, of Israel being God's wife. And we see time and time and time again how she's adulterous. Uh, there's just so much um, inconsistency and so much idolatry that goes on with Israel. God sits here and wrestles. And it's almost as if to say, the child, the children of Jerusalem, the children of Israel over here are bound to be slaves, that there is no answer to that. But then this verse you have to wrestle with, how does the desolate woman have more children than the woman who's married? I have said and I wrestled with this for weeks. And here's the best way that I can explain it. It is because the children of the desolate woman are not by works. They are not just 
out of obligation of marriage. They are not out of an agreement. They are not out of this, but they are out of a promise and that they are out of faith. And it's almost as if to say that more are the children of faith more are the children of promise than those who are of the old way of doing things. Now when you put this together, we, we find ourselves, and I just need to have you hold that thought for just a few moments, because I'm going to start giving you some information and at the end start putting it all together. So we have this idea that there's the children of, of faith from this other covenant, um, Isaiah 54. Uh, let's continue on. Back in Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. Um, it says, Now you brothers, talking about Christians, um, are like Isaac, you are children of the promise. At that same time, the son born in the ordinary way, over here, Ishmael, persecuted the son by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but we are children of the free woman. And when you understand where Paul ends up, children of the free woman, the free woman is also the desolate woman. So we are children over here on this side of grace as opposed to the law. So that's how the whole Galatians chapter 4 talks about. We have two sons. We have two covenants. We have this Old Testament prophecy. Uh, we have these things that were put together. And now I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey to help us understand how do we get the inheritance of the free woman? Has anybody here ever dealt with genealogies? Ever? I'm not sure if you have, but I I, I saw just a bit of my uncle's work. My uncle, um, who was at the time teaching out of Arizona State, um, decided, I want to go through and see what our family tree is like. I think he was just trying to prove that the whole uh, stick thing wasn't working. <laughs> you know. So he goes through, um, gets as much information from relatives that are still living, and he starts tracking them down. Um, it was interesting to find out that as he did all of his tracking, uh, that there were two groups of Watsons and you know one of them came through Oklahoma another one came down through uh, the Missouri area uh, he tracked the, he tracked both of those chains then um, up through Illinois Indiana Pennsylvania um, a weird thing is that somehow President Garfield got involved in one of the branches there for a little bit uh, and he's basically been able to track our family name almost you know until we got off the boat there from Ireland so it's kind of interesting to see all that work that goes on. Well, if you can imagine how difficult it is to think about genealogies and put this stuff together, I'm trying to take something that's very hodgepodge out of Scripture and let us get a picture of what's going. Because we have to understand how do we get the inheritance. Um, I think I will start this off in Numbers chapter 36. In Numbers chapter 36, at the end of the book, there's this little bitty chapter there, verse you know, chapter 36. It really doesn't have a whole lot of information, but except for verses 5 through 10 or so, uh, basically here's the story. Uh, a man by the name of Zelophehad had some daughters. He had never had any sons. And it was, you know, the, the, the girls here were kind of concerned that, well, when dad dies, there's no man to take over the family inheritance. So what do we do? Um, because if we marry into another tribe, then that other tribe gets the inheritance, and it just kind of becomes a whole big mess. And so Abraham, or excuse me, Moses prayed, talks to God about it, and they said, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to make an exception. And in Numbers chapter 36, we read about this exception, that a woman who doesn't have any male brothers um, can marry inside the tribe of the inheritance inheritance stays within the tribe, okay? Briefly as I can describe it, that's what happens. So we have the, the whole idea of what's happening here with Zalaphad's daughters. 
from there, I want to go to the, the, the birth line of Jesus Christ. And for this one, if you understand, that, have you ever read Matthew chapter 1? It's like, holy cow, there's a whole bunch of names there, and I really don't get it. <laughs> Here's what's going on in Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, we have the, the line of David, and we have David's sons, and they're line one after one after one after another. Until we come to this fellow by the name of um, Jeconiah. Jeconias, he's called there in, in the book of Matthew, also had another name in the Old Testament, which is um, Jehoiachin. Yeah, Jehoiachin. And in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 28 through 30, Jehoiachin was a very bad king. He was evil. God pretty much said, ah, you know, I would take you off like a signet ring and never put you back on. And in verse 30 of Jeremiah, God puts this curse, if you would, on, on uh, Jeconiah or Jehoiachin and says, you know what? Never will any of your sons ever be on the throne of David. You will, it will not be there. Well, from the book of Matthew, we understand that when you track Jesus' lineage, we have a blood curse that is on this line, and this is where Joseph ends up. Joseph ends up in this line from Jeconiah as the deposed kings of Israel. And, you know, here's Joseph. Okay. One thing that we have to understand is that there's a blood curse, so Joseph's children will never sit on the throne of Israel because of that curse that was back there in Jeremiah. So it leaves God with some things to sort out. What happens is that because of the promise made to Zelophehad's daughters, we have Mary, who it looks like doesn't have any male siblings. We see in verse 23 of Luke chapter 3, it says, Now Jesus, as it was supposed, was the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. Well, just to make things worse, guess what? Joseph's father, that we have listed in Matthew's name, is not Heli. So what happened? How do we start putting this together? The best scholarship that I've read says that Heli adopted Joseph to be his son so that he would have the inheritance of, of, of his daughter, Mary, so when you have Jesus being born of a virgin birth, here's what happens. Jesus is now no longer cursed by the blood curse that was put on Jeconiah's line. Um, he also has been assured the inheritance. Through his father Joseph, he has a legal claim to the cross. Through his mother Mary, he keeps the inheritance that was promised to David. When you understand what Jesus did, and then by Jesus obviously not having physical children, guess what? The line stops there. Jesus is the only one who is entitled not only to the legal throne of David, but also to the inheritance that was promised throughout that entire Old Testament stream there. But because now Jesus doesn't have children, what happens? Well, it's an amazing thing because God, because Jesus Christ's blood has redeemed us, he has brought us into the family of God. We are called the children of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We also get to partake of the inheritance. We are children of faith. We are children of grace. And therefore, understand that everything God was doing in the Old Testament comes together and puts back this whole thing. Greater are the children of the desolate woman. Now when we put all this together, that leaves you and I in an interesting, interesting place. Because Jesus Christ's blood has redeemed us as those being underneath the law, we were over here. And when you add to that what Jesus did as he lived a perfect life, as he was the Passover sacrifice, as he was the Redeemer, as he was raised again, it brings you and I into a relationship, not only spiritually, but also legally. 
into a relationship with God that still for me is difficult for me to put all these chains together and understand, wow, God, you really did something amazing through all of this. See, we have a tendency to buy into the lie of the enemy. You're not good enough. You're not perfect enough. You're not whatever enough to be loved by God. I think it's important for us who are of faith to understand that it's our faith, which is Paul's whole case here, it is our faith in Jesus Christ that makes us free, not our works. It is so important for us to understand that when we stand over here and we try to do what Abraham did and help out God, and it's like, God, here's all the good things that I did and I helped you and made your promise come true and look at all this. Yeah, it's still in opposition even to today. We live in a time where the children of Abraham, both sides, are fighting like never before. A number of weeks ago, we had uh, a thing on Sunday evening about the persecuted church. You need to understand that this fight the sibling rivalry that has gone on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years is still going on. Two ideologies trying to get to God. One of them says, I will get to God by doing the things that God wants. I will kill infidels. <laughs> I will be a person of hate, not a person of peace do it by force. The other side does it by grace. Does it by freedom. And if you don't really want to put your eyes to the problem, here it is. This world over here today in 2012 wants to make the world slaves. You need to understand we have a world over here that's so desperately trying to be free, and yet we don't appreciate the freedom that we have. I'm not sure where you are today. I'm not sure where your faith is. My encouragement to you today is this, though. If you've not explored freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. I would like to encourage you this week to spend some time in Galatians chapter 5. Because next week, when we take a look at the freedom that we have in Christ, it may surprise you that freedom, just like our American freedom, came at the cost of blood. The difference is, is that the person who shed their blood for my freedom there at the cross got up and walked it again. And that is why the resurrection, that is why being redeemed, that is why understanding our position as children in the family of God is so important. Because we will have a tendency to look at ourselves as people who are not free. It brings some extra meaning that if the Son will set you free, you will be free indeed. If you're still wrestling with the old ways of doing things, today's the day to let the legalism go. Just let it go. If you're too worried about what you're free to do in Jesus Christ, start digging in Scripture. See what you're free to do. Understand what God did throughout all of the Old Testament, through what happened there at the cross through what Jesus Christ really did to bring you into a relationship with, with God 
that is not just a subservient relationship, but a child.